So our theory of plate tectonics um, assumes that we have plates that are that we have plates that our crust is made up of these plates and that the plates move around. Because we have lots of plates and they're all moving, they're moving in different directions with respect to one another. And so where those plates meet are called boundaries or where they're separating away from one another. Those are called boundaries. And the different kinds of boundaries create different landforms, things that we can see on the surface of the Earth or we can map underneath the, um, underneath the water. So we're going to talk today about the different kind of boundaries that are created by our plates as the plates move around. So once again, our crust is made up of two different kind of layers. We've got the lithosphere, which is the upper layer of Earth's crust, and that's broken into our oceanic crust, or that crust that's under the ocean, and our continental crust, or the crust that we walk on that makes up our continents. Um, just as a little side note, the continental crust um, actually extends out to where the continental shelf is at. So part of the continental crust is actually underwater, um, but it's still attached to the big part of the continent. So when you go to the beach, and you go out and you're playing in the ocean or something like that, or you're walking out into the ocean, you're still on the continental crust. It goes until where that big drop-off is at, and then that's where, once the drop-off happens, then that's usually where the piece of oceanic crust meets the continental crust. So our lithosphere, our two different kinds of oceanic crust, our oceanic crust and our continental crust, they're going to float on our asthenosphere, which is plastic, which means that it has solid characteristics and it has liquid characteristics. That's what it means to be a plastic. It means that it's going to flow to meet the shape of a container, kind of like a liquid does, but it also is somewhat rigid. So like if you take silly putty, for example, and you hit silly putty really hard with a hammer, really fast and sharp, you can actually get parts of it to break off, and that's because it has some properties of a solid as well, and the asthenosphere is like that. So we've got three different kinds of boundaries, and this is how you labeled your flipbook. And we're going to go through our three different boundary types, our divergent, our convergent, and our transformable. As you're listening to the video, remember you're going to be taking notes on the characteristics of the different kinds of boundaries, and you have a list um, on your flipbook of what you're supposed to be writing on the right-hand side. So you should have already put your pictures in. Now you're just going to match up descriptions with pictures. So here's what our plate boundaries look like. These are our major plate boundaries. <clears throat> there are some smaller plates that aren't listed in here, um, but these are the major ones. So you can see we live, we are on the North American plate, which is really big up here. This is us. And here's the Juan de Fuca plate, which is kind of a small plate, but that's what's causing all of our commotion that happens in um, California with the San Andreas Fault. It's all about this fracture zone that happens because of the way that the Juan de Fuca plate is moving. Up in the Pacific Northwest, where we have um, the Cascade Mountain Range, Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, these are volcanoes, um, and they're uh, in existence because of the bigger Pacific Plate, where it's going underneath the North American Plate. And then this whole area along here, which is where um, the Aleutian Island chain is, coming off of the edge of Alaska, um, also volcanoes that are there because the Pacific Plate is getting pushed underneath the North American Plate. So we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when um, plates get pushed under. It depends on the kinds of plates as well. So this is where our three different kinds of boundaries. So we have a divergent boundary where they're spreading apart. We have a convergent boundary where plates are going together. And then we have a transform boundary. And here's an example of a transform boundary where they're sliding side by side. We're going to go through each one of these. So the first one we're going to look at is a divergent boundary. To divide, diverge means to go in a different direction. So divergent plates move away from one another. And at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, this is where there's a big rift valley that comes down the middle. So you can either call it a ridge or a rift valley. Please don't mistake ridge for like what we say a ridgeline is on mountains that are above water. So we say the ridgeline is the top of the mountains. Um, and here, the mid-ocean ridge, is a rift zone. It's an area where the crust is being pulled apart, and as that magma, we talked about seafloor spreading before, as that magma is coming up and it makes new ocean crust, it's a little bit higher than the other stuff that's around it. So yes, it's kind of a mountain range, but it's not like the mountain, it's not like seeing the Rocky Mountains or something like that. Not quite like that. So this, once they were able to map and they were able to see the mid-ocean ridge, this is where some of those 
of Alfred Wagner's evidence about um, the continents fitting like puzzle pieces, well, the ridge line fits like that too. So if you look at here's Africa, right, and here's the curve in Africa, and here's the mid-ocean ridge, you can see how far Africa has moved away from the mid-ocean ridge. So new ocean floor is being made all along this ridge line, and you can see how the continent matches up with that perfectly on there. So it was just further evidence that what Alfred Wagner thought was actually true. And this one goes um, through the Atlantic Ocean almost from top to bottom. So it's a really good example for us. It's not moving very fast, so two and a half centimeters per year, per year is about as fast as your fingernails are growing. <clears throat> Excuse me, about as fast as your fingernails are growing, so not very fast. And that's one reason why when Wagner said, you know, oh, the continents are moving, people are like, no, they're really not, because they couldn't see it, because it takes a really long time to move. 25 kilometers in a million years is not very far, so it takes a long time for that seafloor spreading to happen. And before what, the, for the Atlantic Ocean to get as big as it did. So Iceland has the misfortune, I guess, of sitting right on top of a mid-ocean ridge. Iceland is volcanic in nature. Um, it's not made from one big volcano like what we think of Hawaii, but it's made from lots of littler volcanoes and volcanic activity from where the ridge line is spreading, more ocean floors being made and all that. So um, when we, when the when the rift is on dry land, we call it a rift valley. So we have um, a mid-ocean ridge on the ocean floor and we've got a rift valley. And so the mid-ocean ridge comes up through the Atlantic Ocean, becomes a rift valley through Iceland, and then becomes a mid-Atlantic ridge. So Iceland's getting torn in half, and half of it's moving with North America and half of it's moving towards Europe. So it's um, eventually either Iceland's gonna get a whole lot bigger if enough magma is able to come up and continue to build the island, or it's going to end up getting torn in half and you'll end up having two halves of Iceland that won't be attached. Now, not in our lifetime, because remember, 25 kilometers in a million years. So it's going to take a long time for this to happen, but we can see that process actually occurring in Iceland. And um, Harry Hess was one of the group of, of um, scientists who was working on um, this plate tectonics theory that what looking for those the evidence that Alfred Wagner was missing and Iceland is actually where he found that evidence because the Mid-Atlantic Ridge comes close enough to the surface that they could actually see it happening so they could actually see the ocean floor splitting open they could see new magma coming up and they could get cameras down there and so um, this was a, a big area of research. Here's a picture of what it looks like so um, these are waterfalls that are going down into the area. Waterfalls, here's a bridge coming over to it, an area where they're looking over the top. But this line right here is the place where Iceland's being torn in half. That's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge going right through um, Iceland. All right, so moving away divergent makes mid-ocean ridges, right? So convergent boundaries because the Earth, because the crust is splitting, right, and new crust is being made, Earth isn't getting any bigger. The size of Earth is the same, so that means that if we're making crust, we have to be destroying crust, and so crust is destroyed at convergent boundaries. And that happens where we have subduction, or where one to subduct means to push down, sub meaning under, and so we've got one plate that's getting pushed under another plate, and where that happens is called a subduction zone. So we have Convergent boundaries, when the plates are heavy, one of the plates is going to want to move underneath the other one. And that's where we're going to have that subduction zone. So we have different kinds of convergences. We can have an oceanic continental convergence. So we can have an oceanic plate meeting a con continental plate. We can have two oceanic plates that come together, or we can have two continental plates together. The types of landforms that we get based on those convergences is different because the density of the plates is different. The oceanic crust is denser than the continental crust. The oceanic crust has the weight of the ocean pushing down on it, and so all the, the particles that are in the oceanic crust get squashed really, really close together. There's not a lot of airspace because you've got millions of tons of water pushing down on top of it. 
The continental crust, on the other hand, doesn't have that. It only has the weight of the overlying sediments or those sediments that get put piled on top of them. And so the continental plates aren't as dense. It's not about the mineral content of the plates, but it's about um, how closely together those, um, those particles are pushed together. When we talked about pore sizes a while back when we were looking at um, the erosion and weathering and how likely it was that something was going to break down. And we said the closer the particles were together, the less likely it was that the um, that it was going to be eroded away. Well, that's because with the closer they are together, the denser they are. And so our oceanic crust is much denser because it has much more weight pushing on it, which makes it heavier, which means that when it meets an a continental plate, it's going to go down because it's the denser of the two plates. So that's what we're going to look at first is an oceanic continental convergence. This should look like the picture that you put into your flipbook. So we've got our oceanic crust, which is denser. It's getting pushed underneath our continental crust here. This is our subduction zone right in this area. When the crust gets pushed down, you're going to get metamorphic rock that starts to occur here because it's getting put under heat and pressure, right, which is what takes for metamorphic rock to form. So we're going to have... Um, Igneous rock at the bottom, because that's what came out of the mid-ocean ridge. On top of that, we're going to have layers of sedimentary rock, because sediments have been dropping down through the ocean and getting compacted over time. Our thickest sedimentary rocks are going to happen here closest to the trench, Okay, primarily igneous rock over here near the ridge. As the crust gets pushed down underneath, it's getting put under heat and pressure. It's going to turn into metamorphic rock. As it continues to get pushed down, then what we have is melting that starts to occur. And when it melts, warm things rise, right? Cold things sink. So the magma is now lighter, less dense than the surrounding rock. So it's going to find its way up to the gaps okay, in the rock, and it's going to form that magma chamber. And eventually that's what's going to form our volcanoes then. So we get enough magma in the magma chamber, it's going to erupt. We're going to get magma coming out, and we're going to get a volcanic arc. Okay, or volcanic mountains that are along the way here. So South America is a good example of that. So the Peru-Chile Trench occurs where the Nazca Plate is getting pushed underneath the South American Plate, and it's resulting in the Andes Mountains. Um, they are volcanic in nature. There's also lots of earthquakes that happen in that area because plates don't move smoothly. And we'll talk about that a little bit later with transform boundaries. They get a lot of earthquake action in this area as well. So same thing that's happening in the Cascades. So it's getting pushed down, pushed down, and then they move pretty suddenly and we get lots of earthquake. And when we say that the, it can be lifted up by meters, I want you to think of a meter stick. Okay? And they've had, they've had earthquakes recorded where they'll, the ground will move like three meters at once like all at once, like it breaks and moves. And that's why these earthquakes can be so devastating because if you've got buildings in those areas or huts or whatever you happen to live in, and all of a sudden the ground shifts by three meters, that's nine feet. I want you to think about that. Who's the tallest person in the classroom? They're probably somewhere in the six foot range. Three feet taller than them is how much the earth moved all at once. And so it can have pretty devastating results. The area in the world where we have the most earthquakes and volcanic activity is called the Ring of Fire. And it's all around, and it's the Pacific Ring of Fire because it happens around the Pacific Ocean. These are all subduction areas, all these areas in blue. And that's why we have all those volcanoes there because one piece of crust is getting pushed underneath the other one and making all that magma in order to make volcanoes. So when the um, earthquake happened in Japan that caused the tsunami. It was happening because movement along here along the Japan Trench. Um, several years ago, when there was the there was an earthquake down here in Indonesia, it happened because movement along one of these trenches. So the movement along the trenches can cause a lot of problems um, later on. And I want you to notice that here by Hawaii, Hawaii is not caused by a trench. You see here, there's no trenches. This is Hawaii here in the middle. No trenches here by Hawaii. And we'll talk about how Hawaii formed later on. There's our ring of fire. Okay, our next kind of convergence is oceanic oceanic. You have the same basic process happening. We've got two oceanic pieces of crust that are meeting. One gets pushed down underneath the other. Once again, it 
starts to melt, we're going to get more of our metamorphic rock right here again, right? We get our um, magma starts to form. It's less dense, so it rises up, and it starts to form a mountain on the ocean floor. Before it reaches the top of the ocean, it's called a sea mount. Once it breaks the surface of the ocean, then it becomes a volcano. And, <clears throat> and a lot of times we'll get these island arcs that happen along it. Just like we got it on the continental crust, same thing happening over here in the middle of the ocean. We call it an island arc instead of a volcanic arc. When two pieces of continental crust meet one another, um, they're, they're not as heavy. So neither one of them really wants to dive down like they do in the when there's the oceanic crust there because they're less dense. And so what happens is that the majority of the crust gets pushed upward. Um, and so we get really, really high mountains in these areas. The Rockies are an example of a continental continental convergence before the North American plate was all put together as one plate. We had collisions where we had pieces of crust that were running into North America and that's how we got the Rockies and that's how we got the um, mountains in um, the southeastern part of the United States, the Appalachians. So here's our Himalayan mountains that were also formed this way. So India used to be down by Australia, and it drifted upwards towards Eurasia, and it's still moving towards Eurasia, and it's pushing up the crust and creating the Himalayan mountains. Um, so at one point in time, though, India was, a, was an island, kind of like Australia is now, which means that it had ocean all around it, which means that it had sea life all around its edges. And this is how we've come to find seashells at the top of the Himalayas because they actually came from the Indian plate that got pushed up as it met the Eurasian plate. So you can see how it's moving towards the Eurasian Peninsula. <coughs> Excuse me. Changes in climate also helped us to determine what occurred with the Himalayas. So once again, lots of earthquakes that happen in this area because that pushing of the crust doesn't happen at a slow pace. Here's Mount Everest. All right, so our last kind of, so our boundaries were we had divergent moving away, we had convergent moving together, we had our three different kinds, and now we have transform where they're sliding past one another. It's also called a strike-slip fault um, <coughs> at a transform boundary. So usually they don't, it's not like a clean boundary like the other ones are. This one creates fracture zones because the crust is kind of brittle. And so it's going to um, kind of rip and tear and crack as it goes along. So there's a lot of them on the ocean floor, but the San Andreas Fault Zone in California is a good example of one. We talked a little bit about before, the Juan de Fuca Plate is moving along um, next to the um, coast of California. So. The whole thing about, oh, well, California eventually is going to break off into the ocean. No, it's not, <laughs> because the Juan de Fuca plate is moving up this way. And so it's got, here's the San Andreas Fault. You've got Baja, and you've got most of the coast of Southern California is actually moving north. And so it's never going to fall off into the ocean, but in, you know, 500 million years, um, it's going to start to be a peninsula. So where San Francisco is at here, it'll probably end up closing the mouth of the bay and this part is actually sliding up this way. These are all fracture zones in here, and that's why when there's an earthquake that occurs in, along one part of the fault, that it can be felt so far up and down the coast because the movement vibrates through all this fracture zone and stuff like that going up. So transform faults don't make, um, don't make landforms. So convergent boundaries make big tall mountains, they make volcanoes, Divergent boundaries make mid-ocean ridges and rift valleys, and our transform faults, sometimes you can see the fault, like here in the desert, um, because there's nothing else around it. This is actually just the break in the crust where it's moving along, and this is see how it kind of fractures it along the side. But it's not making a big mountain. It's not making anything like that. So when you look at like what kind of landform is made by a transform fault, there's no landforms that are made here.